international students um, in some state university in Georgia. Um, my mother was paying an exorbitant amount of money for four of us to be in school. It was actually outrageous. It was paying about $20,000 a semester for four of us. And we're looking for how to reduce the burden on her. And I remember there was something called in-state tuition waiver. A tuition waiver that will make an international student like me um, not pay out-of-state tuition fees. While my school fees was about $5,000, the average American was paying $1,500. So we're paying over three times what they were paying. And um, it was because our parents did not pay taxes to the U.S. government. So they would charge international students higher fees. And so we're looking for how to reduce it to the state of an institution. And in my findings, they told me that I had to maintain a particular GPA, which is um, grade point average, to qualify, first of all, for that GPA. I met that requirement in two semesters. And then they told me that um, even if I qualify for it, I have to maintain this institution by doing community service. I said, okay, what is the community service? I don't mind, I'll do it. Um, they, and there were a number of hours that I had to do. Maintain it. I think it was 40 hours per semester. Basically work for free. And I didn't know that God was trying to introduce me to the ministry of outreach. And I remember the first one I did was with an organization called Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity would build free homes for the less privileged in America. It would build a home and donate it to a poor person. And what I will do is I will uh, join them. A company will supply them the material, maybe like Home Depot, it was pro bono for them, tax benefits, of course. They would supply them the material because they have supplied them the material. Um, just needed labor, human labor, to build the house. So I remember, I remember, um, the, they would gather students like me who needed an institution to maintain our parents paying a thousand five per month. And that was our exchange of not paying taxes to the US government. Our parents not paying tax to the US government. Ooh. They put me on the first project, you know, and they, they would have about 40 people that would build this house in within a week. They would come, people who will be taking care of the flooring. Some people will be taking care of the window, you know. They will either renovate an old house or they will build a house from scratch. The first one I had to do was they built a house from scratch. And I remember that they put me in charge of the grass. They were rolling out grass tough, on the floor. And uh, I hated it, but I didn't have a choice. I was doing that. I kept on doing it and um, I asked them to change the project for me after a while. I didn't quite enjoy it. So they changed it to feeding the homeless. And it was with a company or an organization called Must Ministries. Must Ministries, M-U-S-D, I can never forget in my life. Every Saturday we would go there the homeless people would file in a line and I was in charge of steering the big pot of soup. Although I said, are you sure you did not season that soup? I, I never seasoned it. I just steered it and served the soup in bowls. You know, they would create a dining room for the less privileged and I would, I would serve the soup in their plates and I will put the, put the thing on their table sometimes and also clear the tray when they are done eating. 
somebody else, my friend, was in charge of washing the dishes. We were doing things like that, and um, it didn't quite occur to me that God was introducing me to what he called outreach ministry. And I remember in my in my years of, I'll just say revolt, <laughs> early years of revolt, Christian revolt, I began to question things in the scriptures. I began to question the law of Titan. The reason why I was questioning is because it seemed to me that there was a clear differentiation uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I didn't quite understand why we needed to tithe in this New Testament. And I was the first to really question it. And um, God had shown me a dream, which at that time I understand better now. But at that point, how I interpreted that dream back then was not quite accurate. I asked God to tell me the truth about Titan because I was courting my wife at the time and I was about to lead somebody else. If I was going to be in error, I would lead them in the way of error. And so I needed to understand the truth. And God showed me a dream. In this dream, my brother and I took me back in Lagos, Nigeria, back in the 90s when we were growing up. In this dream, we had um, a farm like we always did as young boys. <laughs> you know, we used to use um, cassette tapes back then to demarcate our farm. This is my own farm. This is your own farm. Plant what you want to plant in your farm. And I will plant what I want to plant in my farm. We're doing that on the dream, just like we used to do as young boys. And I planted some seeds. Now, as a young boy, I used to plant seeds of maize and seeds of beans on the farm, on my farm. And I used to enjoy watching the maize grow. But in this particular dream, I had planted seeds of maize and seeds of beans. And after doing that, I realized that they were not growing. This is when I was questioning God about Titan. I was questioning God about it. And God gave me this dream. So I was seeing my farm as a young boy. I had planted seeds of maize and seeds of corn, and they were not growing. And you know how dreams can be born in this dream? The ground seems to, I could look underneath the ground in the dream. There was a space under the ground. So I checked under the ground, trying to find out why my seeds were not growing. And I realized it was a hard board of plank. A hard board, a plank that was there. It puzzled me greatly. So I woke up from that dream and I came to the conclusion that Titan was not and that's when God put a further hunger in me for outreach ministry I began to take what used to be my tithe and I would go on the streets of Atlanta, Georgia I would buy blankets for those that are cold in the winter season, those that are homeless I don't believe because it's America there are no homeless folks on the streets there are homeless folks in America so, them in the downtown Atlanta areas and I'll hand them over blankets over them. I didn't know that these were all things that were leading me to understand the history of outreach. From working with Habitat for Humanity, working with most ministries, and working with homeless people handing out blankets on the street corners and that. That's how I started. Okay. When I watched our team go out this past week, doing what they did, um, medical outreach, it really touched me, brought a tear to my eye. Because it took me back to my younger days when I was hunting for truth, hunting for knowledge, trying to relieve my mother of the heavy burden of paying expensive school fees in America. But 
I want to share something briefly with you guys that maybe will encourage you in all of this out there. Because somebody will be asking us a question, why are we doing all this? What is the end goal? What is the reason why we are doing all this? Why do all this? Why, why, why? I need that scripture, 2 Corinthians 3. Does anybody have it? 2 Corinthians 3. Let me try to find it. Sir, so should I, I share with the phone or I should just put on the chat? You can share with the phone if you have it. Okay, sir. Honorable oh, no, Father, I have to be done in 28 minutes max. So that we can do something else. Or I can hand over to Essie. Essie, you've done a phenomenal job leading the outreach department. A lot best and reward you. I have it on the chat now. You can follow me on the chat. Mm. Father, I thank you for your presence. I arrest distracting spirit. I ask that you grant us wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul speaks like a lawyer sometimes. He makes an argument, a case, because he's trying to present the gospel the best way he knows how to. I believe that his ministry was 50% the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul was a brilliant man. God used everything that he gave that man to bring us into light in Christ Jesus. Perhaps you're listening to me today, you're going through an experience, you're going through persecution, you are misunderstood. Oh, I see you in the spirit. I want you to know that God will use everything you are going through in the defense of his gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would use everything that you are going through, every great thing that the devil has put you through in the defense of his gospel. The Paul begins an argument like a lawyer. The court of public opinion is about to hear his speech. And this man begins to make a case for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Christ epistle, the epistle of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? of commendation from you. In verse 2, he says something very bold, a very bold claim. He is presenting something as though he is made to present a witness, a testimony in court. Don't forget, we are in the court of public opinion. And he points at a people and he says, you, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Oh my God. Akudo, you are our epistle. Mercy Obe, you are our epistle. Madam Binta, you are our epistle. This man says, written in our hearts, an epistle known, an epistle read by all men. Listen, I know you know an epistle to be something that is documented in scriptures and a book that you need to read. My friends, if you're listening to me today, I want you to know that you are an epistle, your life, huh? your actions, your words. You are an epistle an 
epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Nobody has to open this book to read it. The mere fact that you appear in a particular place to begin to do something for God, you have begun to open the book of your heart. It is an epistle read by all men. Oh my God. You have to understand. You have to understand. If you don't get what I'm telling you today, you will misrepresent yourself in God. I'm a book. Huh? A walking, talking book. You don't have to have lights to read this book. This one can speak back to you. Who begins to make a claim in the court of public opinion? This man says you are our epistle, written in our hearts. Oh my God. Did you know your heart is shaped like a tablet of stone? Oh, you don't know. This epistle is known. This epistle is read by all men. He says, clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. You're an epistle of Christ. Ministered by us. Written not with ink. How did he write this epistle? Can I hear somebody say the words after me? Written by the Spirit of the living God. Oh, can I hear somebody say that? Written by the Spirit of the living God. Oh my God, you get it. This is not the kind of letter you write with pen. Oh my goodness. This one is spirit communication. The words that I speak, they are the spirit of my life. It is imprinted on your heart, is what he's trying to say to them. You are my epistle. It is you. When the Corinthian church walked about the streets of Corinth, there were many epistles on the streets. But these epistles were not written with ink. These epistles happened to be written, to be written by the Spirit of God. continues his claim in the court of public opinion not on tablets of stone these ones are written on tablets of flesh that is of your heart of your heart tablets of flesh of your heart the tablets of flesh of your heart oh a few days ago, my wife was reminding me when I began to drink from Apostle Aramis Grace. Oh my God. I would listen to this man teach God's word. I didn't know something was happening to me. I didn't realize it. There was a deposit of grace that I had gotten from my first spiritual mentor. But I didn't walk in that grace because I never had a chance to teach anybody. But a few years ago, time came after God had put me through a wilderness of separation. He just told me, it's just, I just want you to just stay at home and listen. I will introduce to somebody. My wife and I had tried several churches in Charlotte. We couldn't find a place that was fitting. It felt as though the hunger in our hearts was much more than what they could serve. We were craving for steak, and what they were serving was, was milk. And a few years ago, God began to introduce to this man of God. 
and I began to listen to his words. Those words ushered me into some realms of encounters I can't describe. I didn't realize what was happening to me was something was being written on the tablet of my heart. As I would hear that man of God teach my heart to be open, it to be set on fire. I said, my God. I said, my God. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. Many start to by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. The epistle you are reading right now is being spoken from, from the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And so perhaps you've been listening to me as well. Something is being written on the tablet of your heart. It is not with ink. It is being done by the Spirit of God. There is a tablet of flesh. He does some work, some kind of work in you. He begins to texture your heart. Oh my God. He does something. He does something. Man can't do what he does. It is done by the Spirit of God. I do the speaking. He does the work. It's God that is doing it in your heart. And he will bring you to a point whereby you will become an epistle. Oh my goodness. It would have changed you, the person you are. It would have configured you in a different light. You see, these days, the kind of person I am, I don't even understand it anymore. I sat next to a woman on the plane this morning. And I began to smell the evil spirit she was possessed by. Looked at the woman's face, she looked like a normal person. The smell went away. After a few minutes, it came back. And the Spirit of God has trained me enough. He said, Listen, when this smell comes, like it's to, it to come, it'll go. This is the descending of spirits, but it is now being done by smell. I can tell you the smell of a foul spirit, the smell of an unclean spirit. I, I can smell them. I can't explain it. He has done something to the tablet of my heart. Something has been done. My heart has been configured. Oh my goodness. I'm a walking, breathing, living episode. The same thing happening to you. He does something to the texture of your heart. This, that's why, listen, you can't tell me you are a serious Christian and giving does not come out of your heart voluntarily. It's proof you have not touched God. Oh my goodness. It's impossible. It's, it's, it's not possible. Something will be done. Because this one is not written with ink. It is written by the Spirit of the living God. And he does it not on tablets of stone. Tablets of your heart. Paul continues his case in the court of public opinion. In verse 4 he says, And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. It says, But our sufficiency is from God. Can I hear you guys say our sufficiency is from God? Can I hear you say that? It's from, God. it's from God. It's from God. It's from God. Where does the money come from? It's from God. Where does the funds come from? It's from God. The care, where does it come from? It's from God. The same God that wrote something on the tablet of your heart. It is from God. It is from God. You think we have all our deals paid? 
You think we don't know what to do with money? No, it's from God. Our sufficiency is from God. When God begins to give me strange instruction, I've learned to no longer question Him. My mind races back to the words etched by the great Apostle Paul. This man says our sufficiency is from God. that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from us. Our sufficiency is from God. It is God who gives it. It is God who takes it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You read that thing in Job. You don't know he's talking about how God deals with his people. Welcome to Christianity 101. God may bring an exorbitant amount of cash into my hands and say, this money is not for you. It is for outreach. I need you to start sending it to different people. I say, eh. I said to him, I promised my wife one promise so that I will take her to Spain for our anniversary. He said, that promise you made your wife, between you and your wife, as far as I'm concerned, this money that has come into your hands, it is not for you. It is not for you. What he's trying to say is that I want you to understand the fact that your sufficiency is not from yourself. It is from God. It is from God. Oh, I wish somebody would understand this. I used to be very tight-fisted. When God began to deal with me, that thing, the, the tightness of my hand, it became as open as a book. My hand became as open as the book of my heart. Yeah, that's how we gauge the ruler. How, how transformed, how transfigured you've been. Now. Being with Christ, spending time with Christ. The Bible says in the book of Luke, the rich man and Lazarus, that there was a rich man that lived in sumptuous living who was dressed in purple and fine linen. And there was a beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate every day, and begging to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores. You don't know that that Lazarus guy that was laid at his gate that was God's ruler to look at how 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 clean the guy was as far as generosity. That was God's measurement of his rulership, his ruler. The, the rich, the Lazarus that was at his gate, that was the ruler that was at his gate. God is measuring how generous he is. Said he was laid at his gate every day. And this guy was begging to be fed. From the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. I began to understand that when God brings needs into my life like that, instructions, it is their needs, their clear needs in the body of Christ, but they come to me as the instruction of what to do with my funds because my sufficiency is of God. Is looking at how much I've grown in generosity. Paul continues his speech in the court of public opinion. It says in verse 6, God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Can I hear somebody say, I am a minister of the new covenant? Can I hear you guys say that? I am a minister uh, of the new covenant. Oh my God. I am a minister, minister, minister of the new covenant. I am a minister of the new covenant. You don't have a clue that when you go out for outreach, you are a minister of the new covenant. A marketplace minister involved in outreach. You are a minister of the new covenant. But there is a promise I want you to see. So that you understand why you are doing all this. 
It's not unto man, it's unto God. You are a minister of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. The same spirit that etched those words in your heart. That began to expand the boundaries of your heart. That began to make the life of God flow in the form of generosity. Flow through you. He says, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Oh, see, the day these words came to life for me, I began to laugh at the devil's tricks against me. <laughs> My God, the devil is such a loser. When these words came alive in my heart, see, there are some scriptures that Paul wrote that when I came to the realization of those scriptures, I, I no longer struggle with certain things. Those words, ah, oh, I don't have the time. I explained to those words to people that I met in Kenya. That this is the secret, how you can overcome certain things. The letter kills. The spirit gives life. The spirit gives life. You are a minister of the new covenant. Keep that in mind each time you go on outreach. in mind Paul begins to make his case further in the court of public opinion this man says but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious now he's referring to Moses Moses is 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 associated with the law the Bible says, but the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Moses is associated with the law. He begins to make a case and he begins to say that this law had an associating glory with it. Oh my goodness. See, I don't understand the depth that Apostle Paul touched. One of my prayers that I pray is, Lord, can I meet this man in the spirit? I've met some saints. Glory to God. I've met some saints in the Bible. I've met angels. I want to meet the Apostle Paul. The, the, the depth this man had. Oh. He said, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones that's the, the one that god gave him was glorious so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away now let me pause here the the glory on the face of moses did not come from the stones it came from spending time with God and spending time in God's presence. It is true that God wrote on those stones. The first one, he broke it. But that's not where the glory came from. It came from spending time in God's presence. I don't have time to take us back to that scripture. You'd have seen what really happened. But Paul is making a case here saying that if the ministry of death now the reason why he called it the ministry of death is because the law leads to death the strength of sin of the of, of sin is the law if there are no laws there is no sin if i say that anybody who puts another man to death will be killed at that time a law was created if anybody puts somebody else to death that person has sinned 
and it will lead to death because the wages of sin is death. So he's trying to help them understand that the law could not help us. That's why we have a new covenant. That's why you happen to be a minister of the new covenant. Oh my God. The strength of sin is the law. If there are no laws, there will be no sins. So Paul is making a case in the court of public opinion. He says, if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stone, if that ministry was glorious, oh my God. It was so glorious that they could not look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. And that glory was passing away. The law was passing away. The Bible calls Moses the law. It says when Moses is read, it was passing away. It was all types and shadows pointing to Jesus Christ who brought the new covenant with his blood. It says in verse 8, how will the ministry of the spirit <laughs> oh my god the devil is such a soul loser how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious for if the ministry of condemnation had glory then the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Oh my God. I wish somebody understood what I was talking about. Paul is making a case in the court of public opinion. He says that the law that came through Moses, there was a glory that was associated with that law. But in all of its glory, that thing was passing away. The law was not made to be permanent. Man could not fulfill the demands of the law. That's why Christ had to come and die for our sins. It was because the law existed that sin came into the world. Oh my goodness. When God said, do not eat of this tree, that is a law. And the second they broke that law, sin entered the world so he says if by one man sin entered the world very important what i'm saying he's now making us understand that that there was a glory with that system but as glorious as it was they could not look at the face of moses and all of that glory was passing away then he begins to explain to us that there is a glory in this new covenant. The one that you are a minister of. Oh my goodness. Listen. If I know what I know now. Each time I was in most ministries, servant tables. I would have the mindset that I'm a minister of the new covenant. When I walked that habitat for humanity. For the sake of having instant tuition. Oh my God. I would have been doing it for something else. I would have had in mind that I was a minister of the new covenant. Because this new covenant has a glory associated with it. His presence is here. He says that the children of Israel could not look at Moses' face because of the glory of his countenance. And that glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now, let me explain to you. The ministry of the Spirit starts and is legitimate because it's inside of you. Mercy, can I hear you say that the Spirit is inside of you? The carry of the spirit. The spirit is inside of me. 
Yeah, yeah, he's inside you. He's inside you. He's inside you. I was at the E group for real estate on Saturday. I'm trying to explain to them that the glory that you are looking for is inside you. What we lack is how to bring out that glory. When the Bible says the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, that glory is inside you. It's inside you. I don't have time to explain to you the power of glory. It's inside you. And you are a minister of the new covenant. And there is a glory associated with the new covenant. It's inside you. So Paul says, how will the ministry of the spirit that lives inside of you, the one that etched something in your heart, that made your heart a tablet? Oh my goodness. <laughs> will the ministry of that spirit not be more glorious you can't compare it to what Moses had the guy was a minister of the law and that law was passing away it was passing away and in verse 9 he brings it home he says for if the ministry of condemnation had glory that's the law then the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Oh my God. What you did this past Friday was called the ministry of righteousness. Akudo, say with me, it was the ministry of righteousness. Can I hear somebody say that with me? It was the ministry of righteousness. It was the ministry of righteousness. Just the ministry of righteousness. I want you to understand. You are ministers of the new covenant. And what you do as a minister of the new covenant is ministry of righteousness. So when you go out doing free medical checks for people, what you are doing is the ministry of righteousness. When you go out visiting orphans, now you are in the ministry of righteousness. When you go out reaching out to widows and buying them all kinds of stuff, you are in the ministry of righteousness. It is the ministry of righteousness that qualifies you to be a minister of the new covenant. Oh my God. Messi was reading out something to us before I began to talk. When Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. She was saying all those things. That's Jesus pointing you to the ministry of righteousness. That's how it's done. Sometimes I look at, one day I asked a Christian, I said, I listened to her speak and then I asked her, I said, so you mean you give your tithes to your church and your obligation stops there? She said, yes. Sir. And she went on on a tangent, explaining to me that she trusts the church to handle it and all of that. And I said, interesting. So if we summarize the ministry of righteousness to just paying our obligations to the church and not doing what we have to do, what happens when somebody knocks on your door and that person is naked or they are hungry? Are you saying to me that you will not get involved in the ministry of righteousness because you have paid your tithes to a church? You say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll feed them, but I won't go and look for them. And I shoot my People have no clue in the body of Christ. This is how you begin to emit depth and dimensions of glory. Oh my God. 
a glory. A glory. You know, this morning I had a dream and I saw Akudo very clearly in that dream. And I sent her some words on my way to the airport. And I said, this is what God is doing with you. And I began to ask God, why Akudo? Why did you just show me this randomly? I know she's my personal person, but why did I just see this? This just came from nowhere. He said, she doesn't know that what she did last Friday, uh, coordinating that medical outreach, being involved in the ministry of righteousness, she was becoming a minister of the new covenant. And in the ministry of the new covenant, there are depths and there are dimensions. It does not end with outreach. He releases a five-fold ministry gift to you. Oh my God. Because there is a glory of the new covenant. And the more you serve in that new covenant, the more that glory will begin to shine. The more that glory will begin to come out. When you hear people say, Arise and shine, for your light has come. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That glory came from the inside out. It did not come from heaven on them. It came from the inside out. That's why they could arise. That's why they could shine. There are so many people that the devil has covered them up in darkness, in deep, gross darkness. Your finances can be in darkness. Your marriage can be in gross darkness. But there is a glory that you are carrying deep on your inside. But first, there are ways to bring out that glory. And one of the ways is to, is to become a minister of the new covenant. And to do that, there are works of righteousness that you must, you must be engaged in. You must be engaged in. There are works of righteousness. This man says, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, then the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. It exceeds much more in glory. Because the spirit that does it is inside of you. And when you begin to be involved in the ministry of righteousness, what you are doing that you don't know you are doing is you are working out the glory on your inside. not for nothing we look as though we just like to do activity at the tribe no we understand this truth that anybody who is involved in the ministry of righteousness that person has begun to be involved in the ministry of the new covenant to people and there is a glory a corresponding glory that must come it's like a mathematical e equation. Two plus two equals to four. Five plus five is ten. That's how this thing works. You become a minister of righteousness. You are becoming a minister of the new covenant. And this new covenant has a corresponding glory because the spirit of the new covenant lives inside of you, is in your heart. He has etched on your heart tablets. He has put words on your heart. You have become an epistle. You are the person, the minister of righteousness. You are the person. So I don't need physical stuff to be involved in outreach. All I have to do is show up. I can bring out what is on the inside. Because I am a minister of the new covenant. And the spirit of God is the one that wrote this epistle on the tablet of my heart. So my friends, be encouraged. Oh, be encouraged. Each time you donate clothes because they are doing a food drive or a clothes drive or something like that, oh, you are, you, you are involved actively in the ministry of righteousness. You've done more than most Christians do just going to church. There is a ministry of righteousness to do. And you, like that rich man dressed in purple and fine linen, God has placed a beggar named Lazarus at your gate. That beggar has become the ruler 
to know how generous your heart has become so that it can make your liberal soul fat. I rest my case. Father, I've delivered your word. Let these words become spirit and life in the hearts of your people. Let these words become spirit and life. These ones are your epistle. This epistle is written on the heart. Known and read by all men. All men. All men will read this epistle. We are an epistle of Christ. Many start by us. Written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. Tablets of the heart. Tablets of the heart. Oh, we declare our sufficiencies from God. And so these things will keep on coming. These outreaches because our sufficiencies from God. You are gyre over our lives. You are the provider. You are the great provider. It's not us. We can't do this of ourselves. No man can take this one on. But for the sake of becoming a minister of righteousness, so that we can minister the new covenant to your people. And of course, the corresponding glory, which is far greater than the one that was of the, the law of condemnation. It rests on our lives. Oh, Father, we thank you because what the devil means for evil in our life, we have defeated him forever just by this revelation knowledge. Forever. What he thinks he has won, oh, he has only just begun to lose. Because there is a glory we are carrying on our inside. And that is the glory that paralyzes the works of Satan. <laughs> oh my God. A far greater glory. The glory of the new covenant. Oh, we ascribe and we sign up, oh God, to be ministers. Ministers of righteousness. Walking the new covenant in the lives of your people. Thank you, Father. Bless your holy name. For in Jesus' precious and matchless name we pray. Amen.